All right, if everyone want to take your seat, I think we have a quorum. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to remind everyone to please, if you would, silence your cell phones. And uh, let me look at mine. I just had it on loud. Let me put mine. I don't know how you do that. All right. And uh, again, if you have anything you want to comment to any member of the committee, please see one of our assistants over there. And they'd be glad to take a message to any member of the committee. Uh, before we start, I'd like to ask uh, Representative Tommy Benton, if he would, if he would have our invocation for us. Tommy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We could uh, bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we again thank you for another day. We ask that you uh, grant us wisdom as we go about uh, making decisions for the people of the state of Georgia. Lead, guide, and direct us in all the things we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh -huh. All right, at this time I'm going to ask us to start off and ask uh, Representative Cassis, if he would, to make, uh, first of all, let me ask this, do we have anybody in the audience that has never been here before, this is your first visit with us, any students, any teacher, any visitors, raise your hand, let us, let us recognize you. We, we have some new legislators, yeah, come on up here, anybody that's new that wants to, we'd like to know who you are, that you've never been here before. All right, well then all of us, hey, stand up and tell us who you are, we like that, stand up and tell us who you are, we're going, we like to meet you. Come on. Huge advocate of say it louder of what? Okay, all right. Okay, thank you for coming, we appreciate that, all right. Okay, no one else. Okay, if we would, let's have uh, Representative Cassis now. We'll uh, sign our bills. Very well. <clears throat> um, new legislation, uh, House Bill 874 by Representative Reese. Um, this is a bill that will require an annual report on bullying incidents. This is being assigned to academic support. Academic support. House Resolution 1277 by Representative Neal. And it is a resolution creating a House Study Committee on Expulsion. Um, we're assigning this one to Academic Achievement. academic achievement and House Resolution 1335 by Representative Holcomb. This is uh, proposing an amendment to the Constitution clarify the authority of the state to establish statewide education policy. This is being assigned to academic innovations. Academic innovations. And that's all the bills, Mr. Chairman. All right, Representative Costas, you're going to have some uh uh, subcommittee meetings next next week. Could you please tell us what bills you'll be hearing and what when your meeting will be? Well, we don't have the date or the time for the meeting yet. It will be early next week for academic achievement. And right now the agenda will reflect House Bill 692 by Representative Mitchell and House Bill 821 by Representative Oliver. We will be hearing those two bills. All right. And a Representative Setzler, is he here? He will be meeting, and I'll let you know now, he will be meeting next week. And and if you'll give me, I don't have those numbers with me, I don't have my folder, but he'll be hearing the two bills uh, dealing with the Georgia High School Association, one from, I think, Representative Neal, and the other is Representative it's House Alan Bill, Peake. That is House Bill. House Bill 809 and House Bill 836. They will be heard next week. And also, Representative... Uh, Nix will be having a uh, hearing, and he'll be getting out the notice, and I'm not sure what bills he'll be hearing, but he'll be back here in a few minutes, because it's his bill we're hearing today. So, But while we're waiting on him to come in, if someone is here, and Abby, if you would, just give him a call and let him know we're ready to hear his bill. If you, uh, or Courtney, if one of y'all, I have it, I have him in my phone if y'all want to call him. We need to let him know his bill's ready. Uh, but in the interim, let me say, because I've had several people ask me, we are not hearing today the Constitution Amendment Charter Constitution Amendment, and we're not going to be uh, seeing the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, 
enabling legislation. But however, I do have with me today, and we will be from the committee now, we will answer any questions you want. Uh, Re Representative uh, uh, Lindsay here, uh, majority, majority Whip, will be glad to take any questions. So at this time, I will entertain any question you may have that you'd like to talk. And I'll give you a chance, Reverend Lindsay, if you want to say something first. 17. Yeah, just All right. um, in general, um, uh, I believe that the members of both the, 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 the Democratic and Republican Caucus have both been uh, emailed a, a copy of the bill uh, for y'all's consideration. Uh, it is a before the committee at this time, but we are working on, on the language. We, we believe uh, that we have uh, worked out some very good language that will take care of the primary concerns folks have expressed to us. Uh, the two primary concerns that we heard uh, regarding the substance of the bill was to make sure that there was a proper definition of charter schools and what we have done in that uh, regard is simply take the language that is already existing in Georgia law regarding the definition of charter schools and put it in the constitutional amendment so that no one has to worry that someone's going to later come around and try to turn a pig into a horse uh, and call something that clearly shouldn't be a charter school a charter school. Um, we felt that that was important to allay any concerns like that. The second concern that we've been hearing uh, that uh, that uh, Speaker Pro Tem had already spoken to in terms of it being in the in the proposed enabling legislation coming down the pipeline is to make sure that folks are reassured that that local dollars will not either directly or indirectly uh, be uh, be used to support a, a school that is uh, chartered by the state of Georgia. Uh, with the help of a, a lot of different uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle, and we are very grateful for their input, uh, we have tried to craft lang language that will go into 1162 that will do just that uh, so that local systems can be reassured that if the state should elect to charter a school, uh, that, that those funds will be uh, from the state of Georgia and will not either directly or indirectly uh, be pulled from local school systems. That's essentially what we're looking at uh, as we work uh, through this process. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the assistance of folks from uh, both sides of the aisle. Um, our friends in, in rural areas have a particular concern to make sure that the dollars are protected, and, uh, and a lot of our friends in urban areas are, uh, have that concern as well, as do I, um, as, as a representative of the Atlanta, uh, representative of the city of Atlanta. So anyway, I do appreciate folks' input. I just wanted to give you all, the speaker, uh, the chairman asked for me to give you all a progress report. I believe that we are making progress. Someone has asked me when, when we should expect to bring the bill to the floor, and the simple answer is we'll bring it to the floor. We are comfortable that we have the language right uh, and that we have 120 plus one vote. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any questions? Anyone have a question or a comment? Very good. All right, I see walking in the star of today's show. So I appreciate, he's been busy in other meetings. He had several other meetings, I want you to know, and the poor guy has just been working himself to death today, so we're just glad to hear. Kayla, I'd like to ask you to come, if you would, this time and join uh, Representative Nix. So if there are no other questions for Representative uh, Lindsay now, if you do see him afterwards and you talk to him, I see you. No, I don't have a question for him. I have a question for you. Why don't you, uh, what's your number? I have number 10. 10, Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm beginning to get some questions about this equalization bill. Yes. When are you all holding your open house, or did you hold it? We've held two of them. And will we you hold yet one more, please? I will meet with you and anyone else that wants to meet with me. I'll tell you what we'll do. Where's Rep? Here he is. Right after we finish here, Super. anyone who wants to stay and talk about, that's a good, thank you for that lead-in, but we are going to be hearing that House bill tomorrow. And anyone who'd like to talk about equalization, anyone in the audience, or any, especially legislators first, please see us after. We've held two open houses. Matter of fact, we met four hours, I think, wasn't it? We met four hours and had lots and lots of representatives come through and both sides of the, of the aisle, and so we really appreciate it. So we'll be holding an oven right after. That's a good idea, Representative Ash. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. With no further ado, uh, we're, today we have on our agenda to uh, take up is House Bill 825, 825 by Representative Nix. So at this time, I'll turn it over to you, Representative Nix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being late. Uh, That's quite all right. I was actually right. working on an education issue. I was talking with the... Uh, president of West Georgia Technical College about issues very close to the things we're, we're discussing. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry the time got away from me. Quite all right. Um, 
I want to present uh, House Bill 825 passed out of the uh, subcommittee uh, last week. It's a, it's a simple bill uh, brought, to, brought to us by the Professional Standards Commission uh, that will simply take the 90-day uh, the time frame that a, uh, a teacher has when they're accused of a, uh, uh, by a student of a wrongdoing. Uh, there's a clock that starts that gives a 90-day time frame that, that has to be in, uh, brought before an administrative law judge. The, the problem with that is, is most of the times when these happen, they are then presented to a district attorney and they're, they're, they're investigated a different way that has no time frame on it. So uh, the, the final analysis is after that 90 days, they don't have the, before the 90 days is up, they don't have the information in order to be able to bring it before the administrative law judge. Uh, and in some instances, the, uh, the, the teacher has, has tried to get out of it because of that technicality, even though they were found to, to have problems later on. So this just eliminates that 90 day uh, window so that it could be prosecuted at a later date uh, it, when it's necessary. And um, I, I don't have the technical information on that, but uh, we've got our technical expert here if anybody has any questions. All right, we'll just say, uh, Rep. Mr. Henson, would you like to say something Kelly to us at this time about it? Pull the mic over there where they can hear you there. No, Representative Nix uh, represented the bill accurately. We, we have had specific instances in which a student has accused an educator of inappropriate conduct. Uh, frequently, those accusations result in a district attorney uh, launching a criminal investigation. And as I'm sure all of you know, uh, we delay the, the civil work and let the criminal work, uh, generally speaking, take place first, which means that in most of these court cases, there's no way that we can have the files and the evidence ready for an attorney uh, relative to a, an administrative law judge within 90 days. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it meets with the committee's approval, uh, senior um, uh, Attorney General uh, Stephen Ritter is here, and he can speak uh, very briefly, I think, on this and clear right. up any questions you if might If you would, just speak from the well there, and I'll podium, okay? Uh, Thank you sir, for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and let me emphasize as I speak today, I, I'm not here in an advocacy role. I'm not a lobbyist. I'm here simply to provide some information about what we see. Um, I supervise the section that does the prosecutions at the Attorney General's office of these educator cases. Uh, these cases are very sensitive and they often take much longer than 90 days uh, before we even see the case if it's going to go through the district attorney process. We think it's evident that the criminal law has to take uh, priority over the administrative sanctions that the Professional Standards Commission can impose. The 90-day provision is one that can and, in fact, in a few cases has gotten in the way of our ability to proceed administratively in these cases. Uh, I personally think that it may be of benefit to the educator in some instances uh, to have, in fact, the criminal case resolved first and rather than us pushing forward on an administrative case at the same time they're going through the criminal process. But in any regard, uh, we want to be protective of the ability to go forward administratively uh, the 90-day rule is not necessary, uh, and we believe that we would make sure that all persons' rights are protected. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? I have three questions, four questions, five questions. All right, Re uh, Representative Cassis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Nix and uh, Mr. Hansen. By eliminating the 90-day uh, provision, I mean, does the educator have the ability to uh, to appeal this decision up until maybe even the day before they come before an administrative law judge. Uh, nothing in in this change in any way abridges the the rights that an educator has, and we do have uh, rules at PSC that that govern certain appeal times and how long an educator has to appeal, and none of those would change. Uh, but I do want to make it clear that that nothing in this change. Uh, will take any rights away from the educator. Right. I, I guess my, my question would be is, so the educator has just an unlimited amount of time to my appeal this decision? My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Ritter, is the educator has to make a decision on an appeal, is it within 30 days? That's correct. And okay. I can After understand. decision, 30 days of decision. Right. That's correct. Okay. And that's actually handled by administrative rule of the PSC. This 90-day provision limits the PSC and the Attorney General's period and the ALJ's period in which they can 
prosecute a case through the ALJ. Because they got to wait for the 90 days. It, well, they, we have to get it done within the, the 90, 90 days. days. That means oh, the gotcha. whole trial and ruling within that 90 day if period. If they haven't, they can't do anything. Yeah. Right. If they haven't done it in 90 days, they can't do it. And that's, and that's to the benefit of a, And they may be guilty, and you've lost that right to do anything after the 90 days is up, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, number 28, call your name out. I'm not sure. All right. Representative Dixon. I'm having a little trouble understanding because when I read this, yeah. it says that in the case where the Professional Standards Commission results in a sanction against the employee, the educator shall have the right to appeal the commission's decision to an administrative law judge, and then you're taken off the 90 days. So it, it, it reads very different from what I'm hearing you say. This, this reads to me like it, it refers to, the, to a 90-day window that the, uh, the educator can appeal the PSC ruling. And they're the ones that initiate the uh, hearing before an administrative law judge, which is 180 degrees from what you're saying. I'd be happy to address that. I agree that the way the statute was drafted is of concern to us because it does open that window. But the critical phrase is hearing before an administrative law judge within 90 days of such sanction. And that within 90 days of such sanction, we understand that phrase, uh, construing this uh, in the way that we are obligated to construe it, to modify the word hearing so that hearing is within 90 days. And in fact, there is an administrative rule that governs when the educator, his or herself, is entitled to make their appeal. It might also be helpful, and I won't belabor this, but just to briefly mention the administrative process it goes through so you know. These cases come from complaints from a variety of different sources to the Professional Standards Commission, and uh, Mr. Henson's staff investigates those, makes a recommendation that goes to the Professional Standards Commission, which then, uh, reviewing that administrative report, decides on a sanction. At that point, the educator can appeal that initial decision of a sanction to an ALJ, who then conducts a full hearing that trial under current law has to be done within 90 days in certain types of cases. And that's the problem. So it's that hearing. And then after that hearing, after an initial decision is rendered by the ALJ, it comes back to the PSC who then renders a final decision or adopts the ALJ's decision. That's the process. That 90 days, as we understand it, relates to the hearing rather than the time for appeal by the educator. So what you're saying is if the sanctions are given, and they don't have the hearing for, say, 100 days, then the PSC is up the creek. There's nothing they can do there. No matter what the results are, they, haven't, they may not be, they'd be vindicated or whatever. They could, the, the PSC could do nothing. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Can, can I ask? Uh, Go ahead. Betsy, yes, sir. Go Betsy, ahead. Betsy, does this not say the educators will have the right to appeal the commission decision to a hearing? And Actually, that's the way I read it when I first read the statute. I, I, I was interpreting the 90 days to modify the right to appeal, how long they had to do that. Right? I mean, that's clearly the way it reads. Yeah. Well, um, well, but uh, I, I would personally prefer to defer to the AG's office that deals in this every day. And if they've been interpreting it to restrict their ability to have the hearing, then, I mean, uh, actually both those ways of interpretation to me are reasonable. So, uh, we have certainly thoroughly reviewed that issue. Um, no formal opinion has been issued on it, but I can tell you we have carefully reviewed that issue uh, under the idea that maybe it was the educator's appeal period that was 90 days. I mean, the actual time to, to go to the ALJ to initiate that action. But that's actually not true, and it's not consistent with the way these cases are appealed. Is there any limit on how it does the educator yes. have a limit on how? 30 days. 30 days based on uh, administrative rule. And where is that in the code? It's in PSC rule. It's, it's an administrative rule under the Georgia regulations. All right, we, all right, Judge, we're going, we're going to hear everybody. 29, that's uh, all right. Well, uh, Rep. Well, following up on Representative Dickerson's uh, question, I, I wonder if we wouldn't be wise to just put that, the appeal period, the 30-day appeal period, in this part of this bill here. That way, 
you've clearly stated what that is. And then it's not a matter of rule, it's a matter of law that answers that question and removes the, the confusion that exists in this language that we have here. And the other question I had, um, that's a suggestion, Mr. Chairman, I apologize, yeah, no, just ask questions. Um, the, the other question is, uh, Representative Nix, would it be, would there be any, any prudence in maintaining the 90-day period for a resolution to an appeal of the sanction in the case where no action has been taken by a district attorney's office so that we can still expedite and get a ruling for the educator within a, a reasonable period of time, which is currently 90 days, um, where there has been a criminal filing in those, in those situations, then suspend this period of time until 90 days after a final decision of the criminal justice system. Yeah, I uh, I'll, and, I'll defer to someone else. <laughs> okay. And and I'll let uh, uh, Senior Assistant Attorney General Ritter respond. <laughs> but I do know that there have been a number of cases in which it has taken the district attorney uh, up to and beyond 90 days to make a decision on whether they want to move forward with an investigation regarding indictments. Uh, a good case in point was, uh, would be the CRCT cases. Um, that decision was not made immediately. That decision drug out for some time. So I think the problem with, with making this conditional uh, upon whether or not there's going to be action by the uh, uh, district attorney or not is that much of that 90 days can come and go before a district attorney makes that decision. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, you know. Um, <coughs> I guess I don't have anybody to pass to. I, I, I will say this. Of course, the way that you wish to amend this, if at all, is your discretion. And I, I cannot stand here as an advocate. I would suggest for matters of clarity that if you were to put the 30-day rule within this, don't stick it at the end like you have it right now. Probably better to put it, uh, the educator within 30 days shall have the right to appeal, something like that. That's, of course, up to you. As far as where you put the 90 days, if you were to keep it at all, again, uh, I think you, if you were to do that, you would run into considerable complexity about deciding when does the case end, um, what other appeal rights might lie in that um, uh, both the district attorney or uh, uh, the educator if there were a decision from a criminal case and so forth. I can testify on behalf of, of what our section does that we do not see a lag in these types of cases. We are always wanting to move these cases forward quickly. Uh, so uh, the 90-day rule, from our perspective, seems somewhat arbitrary, and I'm not even sure why it was ever put in. But nonetheless, um, that, that's completely in your discretion how to, to how to handle it. All right, now we have three or four more questions. I'll come at, all right, uh, Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question's been substantially answered. I, it just seems to me to make most sense to leave this kind of issue in the rule process, and if the 90 days is actually causing some problems, then it makes sense to take it out. All right, Rep uh, number 17, that is, uh, all right, Representative, all right. Um, Representative Lindsay. I, I must admit I must be slow here today. <laughs> Tell me, bottom line, could, you know, I represent an area, as I mentioned earlier, covered by the Atlanta School Board, and we're sitting paying for an awful lot of teachers who are sitting on the sidelines waiting to, to have a, a determination as to whether or not they have their um, certification pulled because of the cheating scandal. And I just want to know, if we change this law, is it going to be shorter or longer before, we make a <laughs> before we're able to make a determination whether or not these folks are still on the payroll or not? Okay. I'll, I'll shorter that. or longer? Okay. Uh, I, it won't have any impact, either shorter or longer, on that set of cases. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reason why is this. Um, the district attorney has decided that he will release um, evidentiary files um, as he deems appropriate on those cases. We don't feel good about moving forward at, at PSC until we have all the evidence. And so... Uh, Five files were released, I think, last month. Uh, we hope that additional files will be released as quickly as possible. Um, but we can only, at this point, take the cases to the commission 
when we have the full range of evidence. And, and so when we take the cases, is completely determined by when the district attorney releases the file. So in the meantime, these folks keep drawing a paycheck? Uh, yes, sir. That is correct. But I hope you can understand the fact that we can't take a case to the commission when we have been told that there is significant and substantive evidence <coughs> in those files that we do not have. And there's no way for you guys to run a parallel track uh, to, to accumulate the evidence to, so you can go forward on your own, as often happens in, in criminal and civil cases where you have two tracks running at the same time? Um, I'm not saying we couldn't do it. I would tell you I think it would be a very bad idea because, again, when, when we have a, a criminal case and, and our administrative actions, we typically defer to the criminal investigation. Uh, that is almost always a good idea. Uh, we absolutely share your frustration, as, as I think a number of folks that I've spoken to, about the slowness in which we are receiving these files. Well, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, sort of continue. Go ahead, Mr. Because, okay. yeah, because you know, I really don't understand why two tracks can't be. If, if the person wishes to take the fifth, they're entitled to take the fifth. However, in a civil proceeding such as uh, PSC action, you know, it'll be construed against that individual, so that's, it's their right, but also their peril uh, if they wish to do so. And in the meantime, I don't see why the school board should continue to have to pay for teachers that aren't in a classroom when, quite frankly, the Atlanta school system uh, could use uh, the money to put kids in the classroom. I've had more than one school actually, uh, actually have its um, per-student ratio in the classrooms go up because they there's shortage of teachers they can't afford to hire anymore and part of the reason they can't hire anymore is they got a bunch of them sitting on the sidelines getting paid for doing nothing by the um, time we completed the parallel investigations and did the literally hundreds of interviews that would be required uh the files would likely be released so okay. i don't think a parallel right. investigation is is going to move it forward any more quickly but, but to get back to the point, uh, House bill, uh, the, the bill in front of you would in no way impact in terms of quicker or slower uh, the cases that you well, refer to. If I can ask one other question, and then I'll release right, my more. Yes, sir. To, to someone, and I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but right. my school system's underneath yeah, this, I know. this gun. <laughs> right. Representative Ash and I can well understand. And Representative and Kaiser's in the Kathy same situation. Ne Representative Ash is Let me ask you this. Uh, do you all have an opinion as to whether or not there should be some kind of uh, clawback available to school systems should someone be under investigation and be found to be eventually uh, guilty underneath the PSC rules uh, and lose their, their license or the, their, their certification for us to be able to claw back the... the um, the salaries that they received while they sat and, and didn't do any work. How would y'all feel about that? At PSC, in terms yeah. of being able to recover the salaries paid to educators while they were under investigation? Mm -hmm. If it turns out the investigation was, was merited? I think that question, and, and I, I, I know I'm putting I'm you on the spot. The buck, no, but I think that's completely mm -hmm. and totally outside the, the purview of PSC. Okay. Right. I, Yes. Uh, all right. Here, here is the order. I have rep number ten, Representative Ash. Your question. I have, uh, I have nineteen, sixteen, twenty-nine, and twenty-eight. That's the order, all right, <laughs> Representative? Ash? Mine's a follow-up on the quicker. And first, you've been wanting to say something. Oh, I, I was going to answer that question, but I'll be happy to, to address it with yours. Yes. Here, here's on the quicker issue, particularly regarding CRCT issues, and. I can tell you from the law department's perspective, we certainly share that feeling that those cases need to move quickly. In fact, we've asked for additional help from the General Assembly to, to make that happen. But I will tell you for a fact, there is, for these educators, a large investigative file, both in general and for each educator. Those investigative files are in the hands of the district attorneys. There is not duplicative files for those folks. If the PSC were to try to prosecute those cases, they would have to start from square one and uh, uh, the Bowers Commission and group's team work would have to be redone. So it would not speed it up. We'd like to get those files as soon as possible from the district attorneys so that we can go forward with them. Uh, but while they're in the district attorney's hands for uh, investigative purposes, they're keeping them 
uh, within their shield, and we understand that. In fact, we're defending that to an extent, but uh, nonetheless, until that happens, the PSC won't have the files and be able to move forward. And it's a good example of why the 90-day rule is not functional in a case that is at a district attorney's hands. I, Representative that, that just to, your question, okay. Yeah, just to, to clarify your question and, and the other question. When these first cases were first uh, complained to PSC, we developed a timeline. And our timeline was basically that we would process these cases in November, December, January, and maybe February. And, and we had a plan and a timeline outlined where this work would have been completed by our commission no later than our February commission meeting. That timeline was predicated on the fact that we would, in fact, have access to the files. So if, in fact, there is frustration on the fact uh, that the cases are not moving forward, I can assure you, we not only share that frustration, we probably feel it as much or more than you do. And if you can figure out some ways in which we, either through a clawback kind of provision or just making some noise about it, can make this proceed more quickly, I'm hearing about it on a daily basis. Kids are in overcrowded classrooms and people are wondering where their money's going. Thank you. All right. Here's the order now. Like I said, 19. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. All right. We're glad to have uh, you back with us. Won't you know that? Thank you. And I hope the question that I have to ask you is no reflection on me being sick. But um, my majority leader said, um, uh, Whip said that he was slow. I'm real slow. Give me, and I'm looking at an appropriate action that was upon a teacher by a student. Would you carry me through the process from the classroom that this action started from up to where this teacher was suspended in order to cause all this conversation that we're having now? Sure. Because I can't see uh, the difference too much where the action would do involving any other adult and any other action. I'm basically a retired law enforcement officer, and I know that if there's any action that happened against us, we are either, until that case is proven to be innocent or guilty, we're suspended until that action is done. But okay. what process? Would you tell me that? And okay. let me sure, I'll be glad to go over the PSC process with you. Uh, let's say a student complains, goes to the assistant principal and complains. Uh, uh, they have spent the night with their blankety blank teacher, pick a subject matter level, and had sex with them. Okay? Um, then that assistant principal is going to work with the principal, the HR department, et cetera, et cetera, and there will be a complaint filed to PSC uh, based on that inappropriate, alleged inappropriate action by the teacher. Now, you do have two parallel processes here. The school district uh, is the employer of this teacher. PSC is not the employer. And so the school district, based on what evidence they gather, can in, ta in fact take employment action uh, should they so choose to. When the complaint comes to PSC, here's the process we follow, and if I'm not mistaken, just about all of this process is embedded in Georgia Code. The first thing we do is we take the complaint to the commission and get the commission's uh, approval to investigate. Once the commission votes to investigate, then we will send an investigator or investigators out. They will do the investigative work, and, and hopefully within a month, within the period of time between then and the next commission meeting, they will compile a complete investigative report, and our staff, we will make a recommendation to the commission on whether to find probable cause or not that the educator committed the act. Uh, the standard of evidence that we have to meet is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, it is not the same standard as in a criminal case where the standard of evidence, I guess, is beyond reasonable doubt. We only have to meet the standard of evidence, preponderance of the evidence. We have to be able to prove that it's more likely that it happened that it, than that it did not. Once we make a recommendation to the commission on whether to find probable cause or not, the commission will, in fact, vote. If they vote no probable cause, then the case is sealed and expunged and it is over. But if they do find probable cause that the educator committed the act, then the commission decides on a sanction. 
We are empowered by Georgia Code to give four sanctions, warning, reprimand, a suspension of the certificate uh, for whatever amount of days the commission deems appropriate or a revocation of the certificate. Once that sanction is issued, then the case goes to the Attorney General's office. And at that point, if I'm not mistaken, that 30-day window of the educator of electing to appeal or not a, or accept the sanction is triggered. Okay. Is that well, pretty accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. At, at no point, and I'm still saying uh, whether the kid was on age or at age or what, I saw that the, uh, the criminal justice system was an involved based upon taking charges against this teacher for committing that offense. And then once that, if, if they saw whether it was enough probable cause, whether that child was on age or what, then your PSC or whatever would take, uh, you know, take charge after that to see that that teacher had violated the law or whatever. Yeah, the school district does in fact uh, and is required to report certain offenses to law enforcement. It is not unusual for a school district, depending on the kind of case it is and the level of evidence that's present, it is not unusual for a school district to suspend uh, an employee based on alleged actions uh, as the investigation proceeds and then possibly, depending on the level of evidence that, that is acquired, suspend them uh, pending a due process uh, hearing. Those are employment actions by the employer. At PSC, we're charged kind of with the long term because we act against certificates. Uh, when we revoke a certificate, that means that that educator can't practice education now or 10 years from now, not only at that school and in that district, but in our state and in the other states which we have reciprocal yeah, agreements yeah. with. So our action is against the certificate, <coughs> but the school district is responsible for the employment action. Okay. Uh, move on. We got four or more questions, and then we're gonna we're, we're gonna try to do something with this. All right. Let's take in this order. I had them. Let's see. Twenty nine and twenty eight. Twenty nine. That's Representative Welch. You want to pass right now? Yes. All right. Representative uh, Dixon. Uh, I'll defer to uh, Representative Costas. All right. He has, he has something that I think clarifies what. Uh, okay. My All right. Let's get. We're getting there. All right. Representative sixteen right down Dudgeon. here. Representative Dudgeon. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So can you clarify on your recent example, where does the 90-day thing kick in that you're trying to get rid of now? In other words, where in that process you just walked us through, where does the 90-day clock the kick rub? in that's causing the problem? Here's the rub, that once our commission finds probable cause and the case goes to the Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. then the Attorney General's office has 90 days uh, to have a hearing in front of an administrative law judge uh, with attorneys, oral arguments, witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that hearing must be fully conducted within that 90 days. Now the rub comes when, as, as has been suggested, many times these cases are referred by the school district to law enforcement. When the district attorney decides to initiate a criminal investigation, then our work essentially stops and the, and the evidentiary files are not available to us for a matter of days or months, or, or as Mr. Ritter has said in front of the subcommittee, he's had these kinds of cases in which it was a year or more before so, we could get the evidence. Gotcha. So you've already had a probable cause hearing, you've had a preliminary sanction, and now the law enforcement thing is dragging out, and that's, and that's the window that's causing a problem. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Representative Nix, I want to say that you did have, this was in subcommittee because we started so quickly and it was unanimous to move it forward, is that correct? And you did have testimony in that. That is correct. Okay, so we, but I'm going to have to, all right, Representative Casas, and then I'm coming back to Representative Welch. Mr. Chairman, I'd I, I like to offer an amendment to this, uh, to this bill and I think that it will. We have to first take a that, that, That's right, Mr. To, Chairman. You're going to have an amendment you want to offer, you think you'll solve the, I'll take care of our problem? I hope. Well, let's, we, first of all, we'll have to have, in order to do that, uh, let me take one other comment. Representative Welch, do you want to say something before we do this, all right? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Representative Casas, for what you have there and have shown to me. Um, but on a different line, the, 
it's the way I'm hearing the process is that we have the probable cause decision, and based upon the probable cause, and based upon the evidence that the that the um, that the commission has before it, they're issuing a sanction relevant to that that employment sanction. So the appeal is to have a rehearing of the decision, if I'm correct in understanding this, to the administrative law judge. So this is the employee that says, you know, I don't, I disagree with the commission's decision, and I would like another bite at the apple, and that's going to be before the ALJ. Is that is that fair? Correct. Okay, and then, so. What we're at that point, what they're appealing is the decision of the commission. Is that correct? Correct. Is this a de novo hearing before the ALJ? Yes. The answer is yes. It's not only a de novo hearing. Um, the commission uh, receives basically it's an investigative file and some response to that, but no witnesses are actually presented. Uh, educators have the right in Georgia to a full due process hearing should they appeal, which means that they're going to be able to present their evidence. Uh, we'll present our evidence. Uh, these trials can take from several hours to days, and they have taken many days in the past, particularly in a complex case involving uh, the type of sexual crimes that these often apply to. So it is from scratch that, that this appeal happens. That's what I wanted to get clear, is that we're not talking about just an appeal of only the commission's decision so that if there's any evidence, the ALJ would over. We're talking about a full-blown hearing. That is correct. And, and let me add to that. Uh, these are situations, in fact, sometimes we'll refer them to the district attorney when we get the file and think these are serious things. They've gone to the PSC first, so a district attorney really hasn't had a crack at it yet, and, it, and the district attorney does need to look at it. Uh, and so, uh, and the district attorney will do their own investigation and can bring substantial investigative resources to that. Um, and, of course, we want the benefit of that as well as not interfering with the district attorney's process. Did that get your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. At this point, we have, I'm going to need, in order to proceed with an amendment, hopefully try to make a little sense out of this, but of course you always, always have the vote to vote it up or down or send it back or whatever. But let's do this. Let's take, do I have a motion that we, that we, I'll make that motion. yeah, we're going to present the amendment first. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do that. After we. That's why I'm saying we'll have room, all right? That's why I'm saying we'll have room for an amendment. I'll have a motion, second. All right, go ahead. Now we have an amendment by Representative Cassis. And this seems like we're moving words around, but hopefully it will clarify. And I will, we're mentioning the 90 days again, <clears throat> but I will explain why we are Representative Nixon. You just let us know if, if this is something you're okay with. What we would do is uh, on line 11, after the comma, the educator comma mm -hmm. where it says sanction against the educator comma okay instead of sticking I'm just gonna read what it should say right after that comma it would read the educator shall have 90 days from the date of such decision to appeal the Commission decision to a hearing before an administrative law judge Read that. Read it again. We will read it again. Comma, the educator shall have 90 days from the date of such decision to appeal the commission decision to a hearing before an administrative law judge. What we think this language will do, a couple of things, we do not want to diminish the 90 days that an educator would have in order to appeal. Reducing it to 30 days, now that's up for debate, and certainly we can, we can look at that, but reducing the 90 days of window for an educator to appeal a sanction that has been placed on them. We also think that this wording will also take away the trapping the administrative law judge or trapping them into a 90-day hearing. All this does is provide a 90-day window for the educator to appeal. That's all. Which I think that was the original intent of this language. Is that right, Kelly? Yeah, I'll comment. comment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll make a comment and then I'll... I'll then I'll allow judge. Has a comment. 
what what that does is is this, and and it may well. I'll, I'll defer to to Mr. Ritter on whether it, it solves the the trap problem. But the current time for appeal for an educator is 30 days. By rule. Days. By rule. Okay. okay. So if in fact you use this language, uh, you have increased the number of days that an educator has to appeal from 30 days to 90 days. Now, even though that doesn't necessarily excite us, um, and I wouldn't necessarily argue for it, um, I don't know that, that I would consider it incredibly bad. But, but just so there's no misunderstanding, 90 days is not status quo. 30 days is, is how long educators have to appeal today. If you want to maintain status quo, then your language should be 30 days. But if your intent is really to give educators more time to appeal, then, then the language in your amendment is, is appropriate. Comment? Uh, I, I certainly agree with what Mr. Henson has said, and that is purely within your discretion as to what your intent is. Um, I would hope that that would be the way that it would be interpreted. All right. Representative Thomas? I, I guess the comment I have is that, um, I mean, whether we want to extend an appeal period to 90 days or not is a question, although that's not really what the changes to this legislation, you know, is trying to do, is trying to do you know, currently. Um, however, we are actually changing it to a mandatory 90 days. Currently, assuming that within 90 days was intended to, um, to, to refer to the right to appeal, um, seems to me that unless I'm mistaken, that a 30-day rule is still consistent with that because the appeal must take place within 90 days. Now, I'm not certain of that, but, but it seems to me like we are, we are just making a decision that 90 days is the period, and maybe we want to do that, but I'm, but I'm not sure that's really why we're here talking about these changes. The problem is how the AG's office has been interpreting the within 90 days and assuming it refers to having a hearing completed. So. Um, yeah. I mean, I, from my perspective, it seems to me that we address the problem that's been presented to us by deleting the language. Um, whether we want to have a 90-day appeal period is a separate question, I think. Yeah, Betsy, what, what I heard Kelly say when he called originally, what I hear us say, and, and Representative Casas too, is that their concern is that they have to have this hearing within 90 days after the decision, but then many times... The, the attorney general or whatever has taken this case and they don't have the information to do it in 90 days. They're needing longer for that. That's why they don't want the 90 days. And, but I hear what we said, but I'm like, are we giving them that length of time? I, I think we are. What we're trying to go back to, Mr. Chairman, is that I think the original intent of this language was to provide an appeal period for the teacher. No, that wasn't. That's already in the rules. That, that's already in the rules. No, that's it's right. not. It's not to provide an appeal period for the. I think it's unclear. I think there are some people who think that may have been the original intent. Yeah. What is what was the original intent, Kelly? The the original intent was. That's what it, I want to know. What do you want? Well, those are, those are two different things. Don't you know? I know. Other than a raise, the, Kelly. The original intent was that the hearing be held within ninety days, and and the reason is that this emanated from an educator that had been accused by a student. And he did not want his case to drag on in, interminably, and he wanted that hearing within 90 days. That was days. intent. Okay. 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 To do it 90 so, days, to get so that teacher. it wasn't 90 days to appeal, it was 90 days to the hearing. Okay. And, and the language passed. But as I think two and a half years or three and a half years since this was done has passed, we have seen the difficulties of many of these cases being uh, Getting the hearing in 90 days. And we don't have the ammunition to go before an ALJ because the, the district attorney won't release the evidence. And all you're saying is you want to have as long as it takes to give them a hearing. Yeah, and I think... I think is that what you're saying? I think Senior uh, uh, Assistant uh, Attorney General Ritter explained it very well. Yeah. We want to move these cases forward as quickly as possible but yet, when a district attorney hasn't released the evidentiary yeah, files to us, it's, it's operationally impossible for us to do it. Okay. Now, any, I have, well, you're up here. With, do you want to make a comment, Representative Welch? Yes. 
All right, your mic is on, all right? And then we'll come back to Representative Cassis. Be sure we're where we want to be. Betsy, you think we're getting close to where we want to be? I'm depending on you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think that there's, I think we're right. There, there are really kind of two issues that have emerged. The, the initial issue has been brought before us. And, and that goes back to my earlier comment of trying to place, trying to accomplish two things. And, and, and one is to, I think the time frame is, is a needed time frame for the very reason why you just stated, Kelly, that there's, this was brought because there was a problem and there was a, a cloud looming over an individual's head. And that, that, that concerns me that that would be there, that we would delay a due process hearing for essentially an indefinite period of time um, for an employee that, whose livelihood's at stake while we're waiting for criminal investigation to yield a guilt or innocence resolution. Um, and so to, in my mind, that's why I was suggesting that maybe we should try to sculpt this around. If it's been referred for the criminal, criminal hearing, then we delay it. If it has not been, then it should go forward and let the person, be, you know, let the person have his hearing before the ALJ and have that resolved. And that's why I was trying to do it uh, in that manner. And then the 30-day window thing, all I was doing was there was just saying, why don't we, put, why don't we clear up this language because it is confusing. Yeah, and, and I yeah. would tell you that the, the reason we can't separate those out is, is what we explained, and I'll use the APS case as an, as an example. Uh, 90 days has come and gone many times over, and decisions have yet to, been, to be made by the district attorney on whether or not there will be criminal cases uh, regarding many of those educators. So if we tried to separate that out, when the 90 days comes and goes, uh, then the educator keeps their certificate. So it, it's just really impossible I, to do that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, go ahead, I'll let you have a comment since you're the author. I, I'm trying to, to, to figure this out from a common sense standpoint. From what Representative Welch is saying, I believe that he, he, under his circumstances, they would go ahead and have the hearing. They would say, you're fine. 30 days later, the district attorney picks it up. We find out they're guilty, and then they've already said, well, you keep your certificate. Nothing. And so they're locked in. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm chairman's privilege. I'm sending this bill back to subcommittee. I'm asking Representative Welch and Representative Casas to get with Kelly Henson, you and our learned attorney there. And I'm asking you all to please get with my learned attorney over here, my right-hand person, Betsy, and I'm asking you all to have something for us within within eight hours. No, within, within a week for next Thursday. Is that okay? Thank you all. All right, any other questions from this committee? Anyone who'd like to stay and talk to us about equalization, please stay. We're going to have our meeting right up here, right up here. So come by. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>